This is the sermon for June 4th, 2023, and I'll be reading Galatians 5, 1 and Galatians 6, 1 to 7. Plant your feet firmly, therefore, within the freedom Christ has won for us, and do not let yourselves be caught again in the chains of oppression. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore her or restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. Besides, you might need forgiveness before the day is over. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's teachings. If you think you are too good for that, you are badly deceived. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and focus completely on that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. So this is another collection of wisdom from Paul in Galatians. And I guess I'm drawn to it because um, although scriptures are assigned um, with a lectionary, I'm just drawn to this. So there's so much wisdom and you could take each verse. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of these um, concepts. So, but I have a question to begin. Who decides failure and winning? Our culture has an idea of winning and failure. Uh, who decides? And if we look to Christ for deciding failure and winning, what do you, what do you come up with? What do you see? Uh, certainly people could look at uh, Jesus on the cross and say failure. And so we have to go beyond through death and beyond it to life to understand winning. And it's the same with everything in the upside down kingdom. Everything that looks like winning might be failure, given the right perspective on it. And I, my other question for you is, who decides freedom and oppression? So sometimes freedom and oppression are obvious. Uh, later in the month, I'm going to talk about Juneteenth, uh, slavery and emancipation. So there was a delay uh, before white masters told their slaves that the emancipation had happened, the Emancipation Proclamation, and they didn't tell them for months or years, uh, especially in Texas. And so when the blacks, when the black slaves were told that they were freed, that they called that Juneteenth. Uh, and so it was June 19th. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of the history of that. But for us, what is freedom and oppression? It's less obvious. Uh, I think people who are um, plagued by anxiety, that is an obvious oppression. And it's powerful. And it's real. And how we overcome it is a whole other topic. But it can be largely overcome by using mindfulness and awareness of what's happening in the mind, body, soul, strength, all of it, and becoming aware of, of what's what. Um, anxiety can be an addiction. I'm reviewing uh, Judson Brewer's book called Untangling Anxiety, and he talks about how anxiety can be a, uh, an addiction. It has a payoff. And so you always look at what's the payoff? What do I gain from feeling anxious? A lot of people, it's an illusion of control. So again, what is freedom and what is oppression? So Jesus certainly understood freedom and oppression. And the people, the Jewish people around Jesus understood oppression as Rome uh, dictating their lives. And freedom, meaning being able to follow God faithfully, be covenant people with God. That's what they saw as freedom. And that Rome was oppressing, uh, the rule of Rome was oppressing. So what is it for us? It's powerful, it's real, 
and how do we define it for us? These are key questions. Failure and winning and freedom and oppression. So Galatians 5.1 says, plant yourself firmly within the freedom Christ gives us. Don't get caught again in the chains of oppression. So I'm asking you today, what does freedom in Christ mean for you? And what does oppression look like for you? Having someone tell you over and over again that you're no good, no matter how they do it, no matter how subtly they do it, no matter how openly they do it, that is oppression. Um, I understand there was a young woman who died. She was stalked by a man and the man was chasing her and a friend, I think, in the car. The friend was driving and the friend went faster and faster and they lost control of the car and they both died. Clearly, oppression and is oppression is real and uh, stalking is oppression. So how is freedom in Christ different from freedom or oppression in the world? Again, you're dealing with different realities there. It's one thing to say theoretically, oh yes, Christ has freed me from sin. But what does that mean? What does it look like? Well, I can live a life of genuine goodness. I can be good to people, compassionate to people, because Christ has freed me from sin. But how is that enacted day in and day out? Um, those are good questions. Yeah. In the 12-step language, freedom from addiction is very important. Addiction ruins life. And like I've said often, we can be addicted to ego. <laughs> I guess there was a, a pastor who had served and um, he was uh, welcomed in as a lay pastor and he didn't finish his, um, his course of study. He didn't finish the classes that were required and his ministry was ended and he went to clergy session and he said, for some reason, I wasn't allowed to sign up for this clergy session. And then he went and talked to the bishop about it and it's like, we have rules and he didn't follow them and then he couldn't understand why he wasn't accepted. So again, that's ego. It was all about him and why wasn't he allowed to break rules? Oh, it's just hard. It's hard for me to watch. But there you go. So what does oppression mean? In 12-step language, addiction. An addiction to ego, addiction to it's my way and only my way is ruins life. How have you been given freedom from your ego? How have you been given freedom to live? Or do you say, yep, it's all about me? And of course, we don't say that openly. We all do it to some degree. Whenever I see, some, whenever I see myself irritated by someone else's behavior, I immediately think, how often do I do that? Like, for instance, how often do I just fill space with words because I'm nervous or because... I'm afraid or or because it's empty and I feel like it needs to be filled. How often do I do that? How often do I just say nonsense? Ugh, I hope I don't do it in sermons too much, but we all do it at times. So I always look, where is my ego at work? Most of us work hard at being good, being law abiding. And we call those who commit crimes, taking what they didn't earn, being wasteful. Uh, we call that uh, sin. You know, adultery is easy to condemn when we're not tempted to it at all. Um, yeah, we call those the sinners. But if it's something we're tempted to do, oh, well, then it's not really sin. No, it's just, mm, I don't know what it is, but it's not sin. So we're quick to condemn others. Um, yeah. What about carrying a grudge? Some people are not tempted to carry a grudge. Some people are. So that's a temptation to sin. Where's freedom and oppression? Where is failure and winning when you're tempted to carry a grudge? Yeah, we tend to think that we get into heaven by being good. Uh, but sinners need grace. And guess what? We're all sinners. Every single one of us needs grace 
mercy that we cannot earn. There isn't anything we can do to earn it. Our biggest sin as good church people is our lack of our awareness of the need for grace. So grace is freedom. Grace, freedom from being locked into any pattern. Grace is freedom to follow Christ in radical ways. Um, yeah, we're more like the older brother that's grumbling out back when the younger brother who's come back after having sinned gets a party. Well, that's not fair. How quick are we to say, well, that's not fair. I don't get that. <laughs> that's ego. <laughs> Grace means everybody gets the party. Pretty wild, huh? So Paul in Galatians says, don't be so impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. And I love how this passage ends with, you must take responsibility for doing your creative best with your own life and your own work. Imagine us all getting uh, a trophy for doing creative best. It's a lovely thought. How can we be creative about living a Christian life rather than just following kind of a rut in the ground? Uh, ruts are graves at the end kicked out, like they say. So how are we locked into a mob mentality sometimes? Or we think, I'm worthy of every good thing. Those bad people over there, they don't deserve it. How does God work out grace for the sinner? How does God work out grace for me? How is grace and mercy active? Today's passage is all about the three-legged stool. Freedom, out of oppression, and community. And we need all three. Take away any one and it won't work. Grace relates to freedom. Grace helps us step out of oppression. And we tr truly learn grace in community. I don't think we can learn grace on our own. It's when we rub up against people that don't like us or we don't like them. When we rub up against them and the rough edges are worn off of us. Suffering wears off the rough edges of us, but often it's in community. We learn grace all over again. Yeah, we tend to think, I want to be prepared for anything. That's oppression because it's getting us locked into prep for all the worries that might come our way. Shame is another way that we get locked into oppression. Grace frees us from shame because we're loved. We're ultimately loved. We're loved in Christ. Another thing is fear might or anger might lock us into a kind of oppression. And so finding freedom, finding grace, finding community in these ways. There's so much wisdom in today's passage in Galatians. Lastly, we find salvation. If we find salvation in what we do, then we become human doings rather than human beings. Salvation isn't about being good. It isn't about accomplishing and being productive all the time. Salvation is about grace that saves every one of us in ways that are surprising. Christ gives us freedom from all systems of thinking, feeling, and doing as a solution to our lives. Grace and mercy throw a wrench into our systems of control and doing. The wrench messes up our carefully prepared systems. Luckily, things work out far better in grace than they do with our control and planning. So it's a matter of discovering the path of grace and freedom. Then we can do our creative best. And the key to all of it is Christ, because in Christ we move into death. Death to the old ways, death to the ego, death to oppression, and we move out into new life. And so whatever it is that's plaguing us, often we have to turn toward it and see it as death. Whatever those systems are, they're death. And we're given resurrection. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Our worry has died. And freedom is rising within us. Pressure to do, 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 always to be a human doing 
is oppression and we have freedom and grace rising within us. Being stuck in fear has died. And when we fall, community members grant us rising compassion to walk in new life again. Death and life, Christ has died, Christ is risen. Fear has died, courage is risen. Amen.